In a unique bonding exercise, Mikel Arteta has taken the whole team to a big circus tent to see a bunch of clowns this weekend. Oh no, wait, it's Old Trafford. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, I mean, it might as well be a circus tent and a bunch of clowns because it is a terrible team. Uh, and finally, I think Arsenal have a chance to go make history at Old Trafford. And we will be discussing mostly that today, um, how many goals Arsenal will put past United and how comfortable the day will be. My expectation is extremely comfortable with no drama whatsoever. We do have a couple other things to cover, though. Tomorrow, I think we're doing maybe the best episode of the season. Tomorrow over on Patreon, we are doing the best non-Arsenal moments of the season. This season has given us a lot of joy as Arsenal fans, both in terms of what Arsenal have done and in terms of what other clubs have done. I imagine Spurs will feature quite frequently. Uh, I'm picturing nine men on the halfway line. That might get into the discussion. I imagine that Newcastle will feature a bit. Manchester United themselves will certainly be a star performer in this category. But if you want to join us for that, Phil Costa and I will be taking you through the best non-Arsenal moments of the season. And just over a week from now, as I sit here recording this, I will be in sunny, tropical London for the final week of the season to do our event at Alexander Palace with, with Ars Blog and Gunner Blog and Clive and Tim and Paul and myself. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see so many people there. If you can't make it to the event, certainly come out and see us at one of the things we'll be doing throughout the weekend and, and get to see Arsenal play Everton, hopefully, hopefully, with the title at least somewhat still on the line. So a lot of fun stuff going on. I'm, I'm, I'm really fired up about all of it, and I'm fired up to talk about all of it with Clive. You can find him on Twitter, Clive BFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. So, uh, well, let's just dispense with this quickly. It has been officially announced. Jorginho has signed. Jorginho gets a new one-year deal and can leave on a free next summer. I think from a continuity standpoint, it's a no-brainer. I, I tweeted this, but basically, whatever new signings we make this summer, I think my expectation is they will get in quite late. There's two international tournaments, a Copa America and a Euros, which means even if the business can be done before those tournaments or during those tournaments, which remains to be seen, you may have players coming in late preseason who have never played for you before and keeping someone with his level of experience, not just to be a coach on the pitch and a coach in the dressing room along with Mikel, but to potentially play early season games, um, you know, in the absence of maybe some new signings or players who return even later could, could be just, I think really smart business. So no issues here, no drama just seems sensible. Yeah, it does. And he's a, He's a top bloke, isn't he? And he's also doing some coaching, I believe, in the background. So Mikel's not bad at uh, helping someone through the coaching badges. Uh, Shaka mm. did it as well, and Ellie's doing it right now, and a few of the players do it as, a, as they have time. So, um, yeah, if I'm a smart move by him to really plan his future. And he, tr he truly is an example, isn't he? We can all see that when we're at the ground, even he's on the bench, he really helping and coaching and, and really supporting the players. So, um if he's like that in the open, he's doing that in the background as well. So that's the easiest one of all, and uh, makes so much sense to do it. And mm. um, I'm, I'm really pleased for him, really, because um, when he walked into our club, we were all right with it. But now his stock has risen, Elliot, as we should say. Yeah, his stock has risen, as we frequently say in instant reactions. But look, it's I don't think it's transformative by any stretch. But I, I, I really think when you have these international tournament summers, the teams that can get the majority of their players or something like a cluster of players that are familiar with the system back who don't need full preseasons necessarily to hit the ground running, those teams can get off to a quick start. And unfortunately, as we've learned, you know, everybody says the points dropped in April count more. Well, it turns out uh, they all count the same and you just can't afford to drop any when you're chasing down the likes of Manchester City. So um, it will be an interesting preview, summer, actually, just before you go on. Um, yeah. Because it's not just a tournament. It's it's the PSR rules, isn't it? People, when do they start? Is it June 30th when you can go into a new sort of financial year, per se, going to PSR? So mm. we may get announcements before then, but we may not see them in the building until well into July. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So, look, I, I do want to get into the arsenal of it, but we did have Champions League semifinals wrap up this week. And I, I think it would be crazy not to touch on them because they were fascinating. Dortmund make it to the final, which was an awesome story and just a real repudiation of the project at PSG as that era seems to be ending with their last, I guess you'd call it Galactico leaving and Mbappe going to Madrid this summer. Meanwhile, Madrid, they just do what Madrid do. They, they you cannot kill them. They are never dead. Um, 
I would say Thomas Muller had the chance of the of the game to play anyone in on a three on one and end the tie. He doesn't do it. Just as you drew it up, Stoke legend Josselu gets a couple of goals to win it for Madrid. And uh, Harry Kane, legendary trophy, trophy dodger, dodges yet another trophy. Thoughts on uh, the Champions League as it happened? Yeah, both games. So the PSG game, it was um, Dortmund outworked them, right? simply outworked them. Out, they had something to hold on to and they held on to it. And Matt Hummels, who I thought was finished five years ago, is not finished. You know, So he was excellent in the game in both legs. And you, when I was watching Mbappe, you're thinking, okay, you're going to do your stuff now. You're at home, second leg, you're only one goal behind. But I couldn't help but think if he only was able to pass to himself, that would be the answer, right? So, um, yeah, because yeah. he he was really sharp, but then he's putting the balls into spaces and everyone's just looking at him like he's some sort of <laughs> like he's a, a picture in an art gallery. You meant you meant to move, you know? So, um, mm. so he didn't really have the partnership. So that was a slam dunk and maybe a slam dunk in that era, you know, and for PSG and how it's interesting what direction they move into next, right? So, um, then we go into Real Madrid, and they have this thing. I don't know what this thing is, but they seem to know what to do when in the critical moment. I thought they were stunning in the second leg. Data-wise, yeah, I think the XG was massively in their favour, and they were, you know, Vinicius Jr. was just electric. You know, electric, electric. And I did read that he's a favourite for the Ballon d'Or now, and I, I'm so pleased for that. And, and, they, and then, of course... Um, Alfonso Davis waxed one into the net, and there was, there was one Harry Kane shot actually, which really showed his quality. It was saved in the first half, and he whipped it around the corner. I thought, "Geez, man, where did that come from?" But then, and he put the pass through for Alfonso Davis. But he's a quality player. But I will say, in the highest games, I don't think he's influential enough at the very, very highest level. He can be stopped, right? So, um, so. Eventually, Real Madrid got on top, and with with various chains they normally make when they go one behind, and and they got they got their goals. But of course, Tuchel now is going to get criticised for these substitutions because he was holding on, and he took off key people. When you equalise those key people, sit on the sideline, and he's going to get critiqued, which is a bit of a shame for him. He, I thought he's done really well. He did make a comment that Kane felt something in his back and couldn't continue. So, yeah. um, yeah, you know, I don't know if he's covering his ass there, if that's actually the case. Um, it turns out the Chupa Moting wasn't the guy to drag them back into, into the tie at the end there. Um, the Eng- look, I, I will say, Elliot, the English media, we watch these games through the eyes of the English players. And so the commentary and all the, the post-match commentary was all about why take Kane off, you know, forget the rest of the game, why take him off? And there could be a point there. Um, and also in the other game, every time Jane Sancho touched the ball, it was like, oh my God, Sancho's touched the ball. So it's very, very English-centric in these games. And uh, I do, I will say, a player that did really well in the games and was Eric Dyer, really. And someone I've critiqued a lot. Check my timeline over the last few years. <laughs> I'm not an Eric Dyer fan, but I think he's done, you know, in these games, he's not looked out of place, you know. So fair play to him for mm. recovering his career. Well, with respect to Jaden Sancho, it's not just the English that were focused on him. Did you see what Lothar Mateus said? No, I didn't see that. No, sorry, what did he say? He said if if he's not good enough for England, we'd like to give him a German passport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, heaping he's more pressure on uh, yeah. Eric Ten Hag, by the way. Yeah, he's not. I don't think he wants to rush back to Manchester, right? So funny that if you make a young player feel important in an environment, you never know what he might get, you know. But if you, so yeah, he's really proven the point. The signs of the celebration, uh, the, the scenes of the celebration inside the Dortmund dressing room, I mean, Sancho was essentially leading them. Like, you could just see mm-hmm. that place fits him. Um, in my mind, two of the biggest clowns in football right now would be Ten Hag and Southgate. And interestingly enough, one is the outgoing United manager, and the other might be the incoming United manager. So I will I will live in this timeline for as long as they will let me. <laughs> um, I, I just do want to do what any good fan podcast should do and make this all about Arsenal. Two things. I think what Dortmund show, this was not a particularly good Dortmund team this season. It just wasn't. I think what this Dortmund team has shown, though, is the idea that you have to progress to be ready to be in a Champions League final is less true than we'd like it to be. And really, it comes down to the draw a lot and then a little bit of luck. Because Dortmund got PSV Eindhoven, then Atletico Madrid. Now, I'm not saying Atletico Madrid is a bad team, but you know, certainly not 
the Atletico Madrid as we've known them, you know, vulnerable, let's put it that way. And then they got a flawed PSG team who out XG'd the crap out of them and they varianced it. And we know football is like that. Bayern almost varianced it against Madrid, but you never variance it against Madrid because Madrid variance it against you. But like, my point is, I think Dortmund showed us that. But one of the things that Champions League is showing us, Clive, is that I think it is a stage where you don't get through it without an elite player sort of dragging you through it, usually. Um, Sancho was a big part of what Dortmund did. Vinny Jr. was unplayable, I thought, at the Bernabeu. And you look at, you know, how Mbappe played in the in the return leg against Barca um, and Dembele. And you really have to, I know it's Billy Carpenter's phrase, and I'll steal it, stack unicorns in the sense of you need those elite attacking third players in the pointy end of the Champions League, in my view. So what are your Arsenal takeaways from this? One, obviously, a good draw helps. For me, two is don't settle for the idea that you're you're not ready to go all the way in the tournament. Believe you can. But then three is maybe we do need to really level up our power and our talent in the attacking third if we want to go really, really far in this tournament. Yeah, all those things could be true, Elliot. It's not it's not really about what's right or wrong here. What I've noticed this year, particularly with Dortmund and Bayern, is that they've not really been involved in an intensive league battle. And mm. I think having a mental focus to be able to focus on that one competition, mm. it makes a difference. Players are rotated, players are taken off in certain games. Dortmund are fifth, clear fifth. They'll be in the Champions League next year no matter what. Because Germany Thanks got to Austin place. City and Liverpool, by the way, losing, yeah. <laughs> losing in Europe. <laughs> and so they've been, they've been able to mentally focus on, on this challenge. And we all saw when Bayern rocked up to the Emirates, we suddenly realized what they were focused on. It wasn't the same Bayern that was dropping points in in the Bundesliga. So, um, and we you know look at in recent history when Liverpool have won it and when Chelsea have won it, they haven't won the league. You know they've been down in the league and so they're able to focus. And obviously City are the anomaly in this, and but there've been times when City have been have been struck down by our schedule. And I have to say, bring it back to Arsenal. The moment I started to have a little bit of doubts about us this year, when you started to sort of gets to March and you sort of see the schedule wrap, mapped out in front of you with the Champions League dates in the middle and you realise for about five, six, seven, eight weeks you're literally could potentially be playing every three days. And none of those games looked easy to me. And you realise that you have to overcome that. And I don't make an excuse, but it's, it's interesting. I'm not sure if this is the right conversation to have, but City were able to overcome it this year. They met Real Madrid at the wrong time. Real, Real Madrid edged them. Right? So we were edged out by Bayern. Um, Real Madrid, you can, they're a special team. We know they may be separate. But I think the, the Premier League is becoming such an event now. It's, it's, a, it's a draining match. You know, mm. it's a big, draining game. They're just massive, watched by hundreds of millions, every, particularly the big teams. And I think we have to look at this. Not, I don't say look at the schedule. We have to look at ourselves and think about how we want to play. And I've been thinking about this recently. And you, you say unicorns and Adam Mavericks. You know what? You know what? Maybe we, we're coming to the same conclusion. For me, efficiency is what we need to add. We need to add ways of winning without emptying the tank. We tried that start of this season, and everyone's saying we're not clicking. Remember that conversation we were having? But we were, yeah. mo apart from Newcastle and Villa, we were winning mostly, you know? So um, and the only thing that was different this year was the Champions League on top of the league. And let's be honest, if we don't win this thing, it's because of Bayern, Villa, Bayern. Those three games and what it did to us, you know, one competition affecting the other competition. And that's our learning before we start thinking about, which I think is correct, Elliot, adding a little bit more offensive special player shall we say I that's the right phrase but an offensive yeah. special player we need one more don't we we do maybe two more who knows yeah i think i i mean i do think it it might be two it's definitely one and that that obviously it's not just that means then you'll win the champions league but i think if you look at real madrid um you know they're not adding a a like shielding midfielder this summer, they're adding Kylian Mbappe. Um, it, 
it, and it it is ominous. I will say that. I do think that Madrid have something about them. It's almost like you just, you can't win this thing without getting past them. Manchester City had to beat them in the semifinal last season to win it. Mm. Bayern, I think, would have gone on to win it, but they couldn't get past Madrid, and now I do think it'll be Madrid's trophy. I mean, I'm, I'll be rooting hard for Dortmund. Um, got a lot of friends that, that root for Dortmund, and I just happen to like their story, but you know they will be a big underdog in, in that final. So R- any Madrid. final thoughts on, on Champions League? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Real Madrid, it. There's lots of articles out there at the moment. I posted a couple out actually about what they're doing with their ground, how it's multi-purpose, how they're using it, where it's situated in the city. It can really be a business center. And they are really looking at these oil-based teams, which there are two big ones, which we know about. And they're looking at how they can compete with them. And so they've, they've invested to increase their revenue significantly. And because they know that these teams have got bottomless pits, right? And they, not even Real Madrid have got bottomless pits, but they, they, they now have got the ability to really push their revenue to a high level. And they're very smart with the recruitment. They have their name. So they can talk to people two years out and say, don't sign your contract. We'll come back for you in two years. Alfonso Davis is maybe the next one. Mbappe, the next one. It's a young Endrick fullback. Is coming, at, we should mention. Endrick, Endrick is coming, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. a young fullback at Liverpool that could find his head turned that way as well in one year to go on his contract. And they just, they have their brand. They use it effectively. They create an environment that makes people think that is the top of the hill. They're about to potentially win their 15th Champions League. I mean, whatever you think about them, it's it's incredible what they do, right? So uh, they are a force of nature. So yeah, it's a very interesting club. And I wonder if we any lessons that Arsenal can learn about how we can recruit and how we can up our revenues. But, it won't be a two-year thing. This is something to think about in the future, but we have to think this way going forward, I feel. No one wants to change English football, least of all me, but it is a simple fact that participating in a title race in England combined with two domestic cups, you know, combined with the the way the just the calendar ha- exists in England, combined with the physicality of the league itself and the intensity of it and the top-to-bottom quality of it, makes it harder for English teams in the Champions League. Not to mention that then you've got domestic leagues putting their teams playing on Friday if they've got a Tuesday Champions League tie. And in some cases, the champion, the Premier League's like, nah, you can still play on Sunday for TV. I'm surprised they haven't put us on Monday before a Tuesday Champions League tie. So it, it, it is simply the case that English football does English teams no favor in Europe. But to be fair, that's not their responsibility. Um... You know, UEFA is UEFA and the Premier League and English FA are the Premier League and the English FA. So it's it's a bit at odds. I, I just think, what's the point of crying about it? Just go try to win it. You know, I mean, it that's it's that simple. And and frankly, yes, a more rested, more ready, less leggy Madrid in a semifinal, two-legged semifinal against a leggy, worn out, psychologically battered English team. Madrid still has the edge, but they can be beaten. City beat them last season. So, you know, it, it, you just have to go do it. Football, you know, the, the grass is green, the ball is round, anything can happen. Clark? Yeah, and the, the City beat them. And I will say this, they were, because we fell away, they were able to focus yep. on that competition. Yep. You know, they were the able to The title was really, essentially dead when they went yeah, to play Madrid. They were able to dead. focus. Yep. And, I, and I, again, you always learn things. And, you know, I learned this year about Champions League the different style of football, what it actually does to you. And you can't play a normal game. You've got to be a little bit more cute, particularly in, in physical contact, particularly the Porto game. And yeah, you have to take your moments. You, you, there is, you cannot mess around when you're in charge. You have to take them. And when you're not in charge, you've got to see it out. You know what I mean? You can't step on hand grenades like we did in the Bayern home game. That will not work. You will be punished. Bayern yep. did hardly anything wrong and they were punished. One mistake from the goalkeeper who was brilliant and suddenly their lives have changed. They were literally five minutes away from getting there. You cannot afford these errors. And so having that focus, being really efficient, being really smart, that that is it for us now. That is what we have to be thinking about next year. We have to be back there year on year on year, back in that last eight, back in that last four. Let's see what we can do. I think it's very important for our sporting ambition and our global impact to keep getting back there. Seven years before quarter final. Sorry, for was it fourteen years for a quarter final? Seven years not being fourteen years. 
Yeah, that's fourteen long, years. Man. Yeah, that's yep. too long. You know, I can't. But you know, it it's funny. Some of our story there even is draw, right? Because fourteen years—the reason we weren't in the quarterfinal is for about twenty-two years straight. We drew Bayern and Barca every year in the round of sixteen. I mean, there were years we drew them when they finished second in their group. It's just, you know, not yeah, to say when, you don't have to get when, past them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When Bayern drew us this time, they weren't thinking, oh, this is going to be easy. You know, no. so we've nope. changed. We, 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 we're we changed, and we will change again, you know. Yeah. I'm sure we're all scouring our Twitter timelines at the moment with names being banded around. We will change again, you know, and it's, we, and it's, it's really due to him. It's on us to get better, you know, and learn these lessons. Well, we'll have time to worry about that. But, but, now is the time for going and making history at Old Trafford. Clive, I want to devote the rest of the pod to previewing our trip to Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, a.k.a. Manchester United. Please stop. I want to, I, I mean, they're terrible. They are terrible. So I want to start with this. No, I want to end with it. So I'll put it at the back. Let's start with this. Let's talk a little bit about how we expect the United team to look different from the one that got rolled over by Crystal Palace 4-0 on Monday, as I told you they would. Um, there's nothing more predictable than United getting embarrassed. But I do think that they will look different. One of the key differences is, I mean, this is how shameless Eric Ten Hag is. He was willing to let his Manchester United team get embarrassed in front of the nation on Monday night at Palace so that he could keep Bruno wrapped in cotton wool for a visit from Arsenal. He hates us. He wants to beat us. He went big on us when he beat us in New Jersey in July. Okay? We don't play friendlies. And that was a bad-tempered game. There was a lot of bad challenges from United in that game. And then he's gone big all season on how he should have beaten us at the Emirates and why. Literally every post-match press conference. So he wants this one. I don't know if the players care what he wants, but he definitely wants it. Bruno will almost certainly come back. I imagine Rashford will probably come back in. And my only take on United is as bad as they are, any United with Bruno in it can hurt you because he can get a goal from nothing, one that he scores or one that he creates. For me, he is the principal danger man. Any any thoughts on how they might look a little different from how they looked on Monday night? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm only reading things that people are sent out there actually. And um, so the players that potentially will come back will be Bruno because he had a he had a knock and his injury record is really really good, and so he could come back. And Scott he had Mc never oh. missed a game for United through injury. I do not believe he had a knock. I believe he was given the night off. That's that's just me. Yeah, yeah. conspiracy theory me, but that's just me. You may be right. You may be right. Um, Scott McTominay's due to come back as well, and I think I think he's a decent player actually. And um, there has been some chatter about him being a target for Arsenal and. Before people laugh, I remember when um, Havertz wasn't doing so well. I think there was a, you know, if you look at the data, Scott McTominay and Havertz are pretty close, shall we say? So I don't mm. laugh at that link. I think um, there's a potential in it, depending on what could happen down the road. Um, and so you might see those two players come back in that will stiffen up the midfield a little bit more because Ericsson was absolutely shocking at, at Palace. And um, mm. who's overexposed. Um, Rashford's not on that list, Elliot, but you know, Rashford might, may come back, but he's not on the list to come back. So, but more importantly, they haven't got centre backs, and that's the key. And they're still going to, it looks like they're still going to turn up with Johnny Evans and, and Casemiro. So, Johnny no Evans. Chance. There's no chance that happens. There, Casemiro won't play. He will not play. Well, if he plays, I, <laughs> I don't. I don't even know what to say. I. I it'll be a kid before. It'll be, I, my prediction is Casemiro will not start, and not because I know anything, but because if you watch that performance on Monday, to go with all the performances put in, but that one on Monday, and you still start him, I, I don't know what your evaluation process is. I don't know who's picking the team, but you you cannot pick that player again for this game. Yeah, no I mean, it, it'd be crazy. If it, if, if, if it was me and you're struggling to find two good centre-halves, what you do is pick three. You know, it's very simple. Use wan as a centre-back. You've got Scott McTominay, who's been centre-back for Scotland. You pick three, and you find three, and you hold your position that way. And But, hey, look, it's Eric Ten Hag, right? He wants to impose his philosophy on us. So let's see. If they turn up with those two centre backs, mate, then maybe I won't, I won't be shushing you when you're upsetting the football gods by 
demonizing Manchester United. I'll be encouraging you, Elliot. But um, I'm, I, I still do think it's important me. to emphasize that jinxes don't exist. If we don't beat Manchester United, it will not be because this idiot talking into this microphone <laughs> said we would beat them. It'll be because we screwed up on the pitch. So, like, you know, it is one of the things we do, and I understand it, but, like, on social media, say something like, ah, oh, United are terrible, and people be like, wait until after Sunday to say it. And it's like, why? Because my tweet will be the... Re- like, that's not how this any of this works. But I do understand the the... I do understand the anxiety because I do think, Clive, that there is there is a feeling in the fan base that people don't want to articulate, but I am clearly happy to articulate it, that this, this is a chance for a big celebratory moment. This is a chance to go do something to repay some pain. We've gone to Old Trafford against some very bad United teams and not shown up. Clive, I, I cannot see that happening under this, this coach with these players. You know, there's an interesting... Um, graphic going around. Have you seen it? Our last 15 trips or 16 trips or whatever it is to Old Trafford. And it's like, oh, Arsenal have only won this. But like seven of those trips are under Alex Ferguson. Here's another way to say it. In the last nine years, nine seasons, Manchester United have failed to win more than half of their games against Arsenal at Old Trafford. That makes it sound a little different, doesn't it? Right? Four draws, one Arsenal win, and uh, four United wins. Granted, not the record we want there, but certainly not the catastrophe people are portraying it as. I just, I cannot get past this being an opportunity. So let's talk about the Arsenal side of it. How do you want to set up? Is there a threat of theirs that you're thinking about with how you set up? I mean, I do believe they can hurt you on the counter. That is the one thing I really do believe. They they showed it against City. City battered them, but United could have been 2-0 up if Rashford had his boots on right. So is that really the principal worry that, we push them back, we dominate them, but on the counter they carry a threat. Yeah, uh, as we as we are recording, Elliot, uh, Lissandro Martinez and Rashford have returned to first team training. So we're being, I expected we're, Lissandro to play. Yeah, yeah. so we we're, we're being not say set up, but there's a cup final for them to to focus mm-hmm. on, and so these players have been brought back in time for that cup final, and this game can repair a lot of damage. I mean, they're in danger of falling out of the European places full stop. So this is a big game for them. And, and I just, I'm, I'm the way, it, I'm sorry, mate, my life history with this team, I'm just not prepared to laugh at them just yet. I will laugh loud at half past six on Sunday. But uh, at this moment in time, I'm a little bit concerned that they're all the, everyone's coming back on their white horses ready for Arsenal, which always frustrates me about Manchester United. They're always bringing the best version of themselves against against us and it's, it's something that we have to overcome I think it's a I, honestly I think it's a very very important game for our season if we lose it I don't think we'll get massively critiqued but we will be open to criticism that we didn't quite push ourselves forward and not saying we fell away because our points accumulation in 2024 have been excellent and normal times that'll be enough but in these times it's not it's not enough yet if we if we don't win this game, I, I think it's going to have a little bit of a, a kickback, regardless of where Manchester United are. But I generally feel it's time for us to win it. You know what I mean, Elliot? It's time for us to do something that we haven't done for many years, which is winning the northwest of England. Liverpool City, United, we need to start going to these places and coming away with all the points. Because we, we talked about Real Madrid earlier, we, we have to just start, I've said this earlier in the week, we have to start growing our aura in that part of the world. It feels like the football capital of the world up there, you know, and we have to start going there and making an impact. And we, this starts this weekend. And so whatever they produce, whatever they bring out, they won't be super match fit. We, we really have to go and push it. As United style of play, you tell me how they play, mate. Honestly, well, well you tell me how they play. They've got some speedy wide men. Bruder can find in wide men. Rasmus, box of chocolates, man. What are you going to get? Is he really worth that seventy-two million? I, I'm not feeling it at the moment. And mm-hmm. and it's, they're all they're all talk about moments. They're all about moments. If those moments go for them, they're fine. But if the moments go against them, they fall away massively. There is no mentality in that group that's consistent. They have no mental identity. They have any playing identity. They don't have a technical identity, they don't have a physical identity. They're just a mixture of players playing for Manchester United. And sometimes they remember who they're playing for, 
and sometimes they don't. But they will remember on Sunday. It's OT. They will remember on Sunday. But if we score, then I think we we score quite quickly and start to move them about. Let's see where they are. Mm. The belief will drain out of them quickly. The crowd will, will, I think, get on their backs a little bit Mm. because it's a tinderbox there right now. Um, They have nothing to play for. I, I think this also works against them. You know, that cup final, like, it, you say, you know, you said this this would be their cup final, right? But they have a cup final. Yeah. So there is an argument that players might have an eye on that and say, what, you know, there's still something I can go win at Wembley. I want to be fit for that. I want to be ready for that. They won't want to get humiliated by us, of course. But I think, you know, I, I don't think they have much reason to be focused on this. And it, it will be an interesting referendum on Ten Hag in a way, Clive, because can he light a fire under them to focus on this? Hmm. You know, their attitude might be like, you know, we beat them, our cross city rivals win the title. Maybe I get hurt and miss a cup final at Wembley. They don't have a lot of reason to be fired up about this other than their manager clearly having it in for us. And I think it'd be easy, interesting to see if he's able to light a fire. I want to talk our lineup. Our approach. Before you move, mm-hmm. before you move on, then, mate, for a second. Another, there's a couple of other sort of variables leading up to this game. Yeah, we remember last year when we were hanging on to City a little bit, when they went to Everton, a difficult away game. Do you remember it? And they just couldn't have scored two goals in like two minutes, mm-hmm. and it really affected us. And we had to play Brighton on the same day, and we didn't really have it. You know, we didn't really have yeah. it. City go to Fulham on the weekend, and we all know twelve thirty kickoff on Saturday. Pep, Pep, yeah. Pep will be furious. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that um, Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, I think they're playing uh, the under fourteens against uh, against City midweek, and so mm-hmm. Fulham could be you know, maybe West Ham, but Fulham could be the last real chance of them making an error. If they any City win, then we then have to play on the Sunday, and I, and I hope that we're not affected by that like we were last year against Brighton. I hope we're not affected by this. I think it's time to show that we, we're not affected and we can hold our own course and really go and deliver. So that's my little worry for the weekend. On the flip side, Elliot, if they do drop points, this game becomes a game where we're going to need an emergency pod on Saturday, maybe if they drop Title points. decided. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. This game becomes, it becomes, there'll be people just driving up there, mate. It becomes massive. If they do drop yeah. points, it becomes the biggest game for 20 years. It literally will just appear. So this game has got, it's, we're previewing it now, Elliot, but we're, we could be previewing something completely different in a couple of days' time, if that makes sense. I, I mean, I actually believe, no, look, you want a team that wants to go play to win the title. But mm. I actually think, to your point, City winning on Saturday <laughs> will make Sunday an easier game for us. Um, because I think the motivation will be let's go humiliate a bad United and we'll see what happens in the next couple of games. Whereas if City do drop points on Saturday and we feel we have to take points at Old Trafford to to be in position to win a title, that's a lot of pressure on these shoulders that have not necessarily had to carry that kind of pressure um, or have been super effective carrying that kind of pressure. So we'll see. Like, I mean, obviously if you offered me dropped city points on Saturday, I'd bite your hand off for it. But I do yeah. think that that would make this a more difficult game and weirdly might additionally motivate United, right? Because, because suddenly they do realize how much is at stake. Um, so I, I want to get into our lineup a little bit. I want to get into the tactics and, and really the unique challenge of playing a team as bad as Manchester United that wears the United shirt at Old Trafford. So, because I, I think there's an interesting sort of psychological dilemma there. Um, but before we do that, for once, I've not waited too long to tell you about brands, and I'm really happy about that. It's going to be all about physical and mental health today on the brand segment of the podcast. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy, but it's not online therapy. It's therapy that's online. I, you know, And the reason I like to say that is if you are someone who wants to go to a therapist's office and see a therapist in person, like I, rec- I recommend it. However you approach mental health and, and looking after your mental health, like absolutely do it. But the getting in the car and driving to the office and finding someone and maybe you, you feel embarrassed or shy to do it or whatever the case may be, it, it's not always easy. It may not even be affordable. It may not be something you can fit in your schedule. BetterHelp fits into your schedule, can be done from wherever you are at any time. 
right? You can find someone that really fits for you. So I think it is a, a, a really effective way to make mental health accessible. And one thing that happens in life, and you know this, you'll cogitate, right? There'll be an argument you got into or something that upset you or something that's bothering you, and you'll just focus on it and focus on it and focus on it. And it will push out all the good thoughts and productive thoughts until it's the only thought. You need to get it off your shoulders. And, you know, sometimes you can't do that with a friend or a partner, right? A family member. Th that's what therapy is there to do. It's get things off your chest. So get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash vision today. Get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash vision. And this podcast is also sponsored by Unified. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, which is also a world-class athlete, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why... I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Arsenal Vision Podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by the Energy Enhancement System or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, well, one thing you can do is go to their website, uh, the Unified website, and read up about it and read about the doctor who created it. But otherwise, uh, the technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, rejuvenation, whether you're here in America or hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash arsenalvision to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash arsenalvision. <sighs> no material testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including the system. God, is that that? Indeed. Not it. Okay. Um, lineup, I, I think one thing that weighs in our favor right now, Clive, is it feels like mm. for the first time in ages, I know you don't like first 11s, but it feels at the moment we have a first 11 or at least an acknowledged 11 that Mikel has gone with in the, this run of big games. I also think it works in our favor that we're not coming off a bunch of games against like Burnley and Sheffield United. So, you know, we played Chelsea, we played Spurs away, you know, we played, um, Bournemouth, who are, you know, one of the best teams in the league since November. We played some big games. We played Bayern Munich. We played Aston Villa. We've been through the ringer against teams that press, against teams that don't give you space. And we've just been to Tottenham Hotspur Stadium where we were 3-0 up at halftime. And I think that their energy and their intensity and their atmosphere is far beyond Old Trafford at the moment. So we, I think, we we are in a good position to come up against a team that will feel almost like a step down in, in difficulty from what we've been facing. Do you anticipate that we will stay unchanged from the team that Mikel has sort of settled on in the last few weeks? I suspect so because there's less risk involved with these players. I think they they control the areas of the pitch nicely and there's a nice sort of synergy there and good lots of relationships. So, And there's execution, you know. So Trotsar's execution in the final third has been really smart. I've been watching some clips of him and, He's moving in the box. He's, he's, mate, it's not an accident. He keeps getting these shots. He's very clever how he doesn't mark himself and he moves in. He moves really good in first phase, second phase. He's, he's a clever guy. Um, the midfield looks solid and strong and balanced. Um, Rice is obviously he's sort of flourishing slightly forward, shall we say? And um, his mm. ability, his starting position is much better. So he starts in areas where he can carry the ball to, you know, from. He starts and then goes. And, and that suits him. I think sometimes I often found it, and with Shaka as well, I found this. I don't want you too high too early unless we are pressing. You know, sometimes we just jump into shape and then he's 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 just not effective. But if he's slightly on the angle to party, then he can he can support party, but he can also receive and go. You know, and I quite like that. If he's too high playing back to goal, leave that to someone like a Havertz eight. Do you see what I mean? Who is happy back to goal, who can post up and lay the ball off and link up in that way. So he's got he's got much much better. Odegaard is just class anyway, and um, we all know we lean to the right with Saka and we build up there and we off the ball on the left. So it's all it's all looking good. Funny enough, watching there, I saw the passing map of Real Madrid last night, and they do the very same thing, but they do everything on the left with Vinicius, yeah. and they they yep. tilt it around on that side. So I've, again, you can learn things watching other teams. What does the other side look like? Well, Rodrigo's a stunning player. Camavinga, it's not Camavinga. Sorry, um. Uh, Valverde, Valverde, what oh, Valverde. a stunning player he is as well. So that right hand side has got a lot of dynamism as, as well. But everyone knows Vinicius is the, is the key man, and so, mm. so yeah, I like the team 
Tommy's very strong. He doesn't, you know, he's he's there's nothing to see here, shall we say? I've got I've got this covered, lads. Don't worry about me. You know, I won't just stand still when we're in possession. I'll make sure I stand behind people and make people mark me or create the lane for the pass out to the line. Clever player, experienced, does his job inside the box, but also he has some effectiveness outside the box. So I like him and the rest of the team we can sort of name. Thomas Party's has given us a level of speed of pass, shall we say, speed of pass, particularly out to Saka, and he's given us a little bit more pauser in a, in a strange way. But it's not us, mm. it's the other team who are pausing when he gets the ball. You know, so is he going to get pressed off? Because there is a risk there. I'm not dumb. I can see it. There is a risk there because he takes risks. But eight times out of ten, those risks really work for us. You know, and what he's trying to do is playing one or two touches maximum. And that rhythm, I think we look so much better for it. And when we're looking for what we ever do next year, we're looking for a rhythm player, a rhythm player that can take the ball in many different ways. And I think part is the, the best at that. I think Jorginho is more a metronomic player, but it's more, it's more about keeping things moving but not always spectacular going forward in a metronomic way. Jorginho's a bit more of a spectacular passer forward. He's a clipper. He clips it over lines, receives it in one, and he goes around corners. So, yeah, interesting dynamic. I, I like the balance of this team, I'll be honest with you, Elliot. Um, at this stage of the season, teams pick themselves, mate, because you're you're down to trust levels. And um, there are other peers in the year where Martinelli would have played, for example, and Jorginho would have played. And um, and none of us would have said anything about it. But this group has done enough now that, that they should play. And I, I think it'd be the same team. Yeah, I mean, and that means then whatever you think of the lineup United's going to put out, they're not going to have a lot of options on the bench to change it. You know, if if they are able to start Lissandro Martinez, he doesn't scare me other than his physical violence, but his football doesn't scare me. Um, you know, if they're able to start Rashford, fine. They're not going to have a lot on the bench. We're going to have the likes of Jesus and Martinelli on the bench, um, you know, which could make a huge impact if needed. Um, I think the whole thing with United that I can't figure out is their midfield dynamic. There isn't one. I joked on Twitter, and I, I, I this isn't a joke. This is true. The key to beating United is to play through their midfield, play through the thirds. And the effective strategies for doing that are the following three things you can do. Carry it forward, pass it forward, or kick it forward. Because any of those things work. They have no ability to stop you from progressing the ball. None. And like, in a weird way, I almost think if United have more of the ball, they are more vulnerable. Yeah. Because... You, once you can attack their defenders in space, I mean, literally, I could not believe against Palace how easily you can create four on threes and three on twos against that United defense simply by pushing the ball forward in any number of ways. A kick, a pass, you know, like a, a boot up the field, a pass. I think Raya's long distribution is going to hurt them. I think, um, you know, any vertical passes from the defensive third to the attacking third completely undo them. I also wonder how they'll set up in midfield in terms of where they'll put their pivot and who will be in their double pivot because Declan Rice is going to absolutely destroy Kobe Minu's world. Like Minu was absolutely out of his depth against Palace. He didn't have enough protection around him and he looks like a young player who's drowning a little bit out there right now. And yeah. he's a talented player. I don't dispute that, but you cannot do this to a young player. You no. cannot put him in such a disorganized midfield where he's so exposed. And he was drowning a little bit out there. And like, if he has to be isolated on Declan Rice, he is dead. Dead. He has no hope. So what are they going to do in midfield? Because Odegaard, Rice, and Party. I, I mean, they they will not have an easier day at the office all season than what they're coming up against. I, I don't know what they're going to do. It'll be Bruno. I mean, Bruno, Mainu, and McTominay? No, so let's, let's, let's pick you a team based on the fact that we've seen people training now, right? So they say they go Anana, they go Dallow, they go um, Johnny Evans, and they go Lissandro, and then they go wan at the back, right? Just say they do that. Say they push Casemiro forward into the holding role. 
Oh, so please, ca- God, please, please. <laughs> I will do filthy things for Casemiro to play the play the six for them against yeah. us. Please. You play him the six, and they may play um, McTominay and Mainu in the midfield. And then they'll oh, play God, Bruno yes. off one of the sides, Garnacho off one of the sides, uh, and Hoyland. But if Rashford's back, what they do is they go Garnacho on the, on the right, Rashford on the left, Hoyland up, up front, and they'll take one of Mainu or McTominay out and put Bruno in the 10 in behind. So on paper, that team for a lot of wages, mate, and a lot of transfer fees, you know, and and so, but where are they in health and fitness and, and structure? And the, the reason why Mainu is struggling is the distances are too big for him, you know? Yeah. One, yep. of the things, yep. one of the things that I do to find sometimes look at other players from other teams and just see how they are in, in elite company. Like you can watch other teams play, but honestly, I urge people to start watching the England training videos, right? Because they are really, really informative. Because you see the best players against each other and what they look like. And so I'll give an example. The last training videos I watched, Anthony Gordon looks a really good player. Seriously, Elliot. You know, we can watch him when we play against us. We don't like him. But when you see him in that company... I watched him in training, and then he had he had a decent game for playing for England. He's good. After. He's good. He's a good player. He's good. And I watched yeah. him in their training sessions, mate, and he's sharp. He is sharp. I watched Kobe Manu in those training sessions, and there was a clip of him doing a 40-meter dash. And I said to myself, uh-oh, kid's 18. He's quite heavily muscled. I'm not sure he's a good runner. In a compressed team where the distances are smaller and his technical ability comes, and he looks like a... He looks like a, a young Chavi. Do you know what I mean? In small distances, popping the ball around, then no one cares about you. But then if you're exposed in a, in a situation like the world that we came where the defender stood in one part of the pitch and the attacker stood in the other part of the pitch and this poor kid took responsibility of trying to hold the midfield, he's in trouble, isn't he? That's why you take a player out and you sit him for a while. But they haven't got that option because they've got Ericsson, who's who isn't a good athlete neither at this stage of his career. So they have problems there. But I never disrespect Man United too much, mate. One, because it caused me too much pain in my life. And two, they've got a lot of pride in that club. And although I want you to be correct, I really do. I want you to be right. I want them to be a disheveled mess. But I just do not feel they would do that in front of their own crowd at home. Sunday You're dead afternoon. Wrong. <laughs> Sunday afternoon. You're dead wrong. I, ho- I hope I'm wrong, and everyone can pile into me afterwards when we've gone there and won 5 0. I really do hope I'm wrong. But Sunday afternoon, live on Sky TV, trust me, they're bringing their Sunday best out, mate. I still think we're better, but it won't, I don't think it's going to be easy. I still think we're better, much better, you know, but I don't think it's going to be easy. I, I think they'll be terrible. Absolutely, <laughs> unrepentantly terrible. Like one of the worst teams we played all season. Now, here's the problem football's weird. <laughs> Football's weird. They can be terrible and get a result. And all I have to point you to is the 4-3 over Liverpool in the FA Cup, which they just did. And the... Did did they beat or they drew Liverpool? Yeah, the 2-2. Now, the 2-2 at Old Trafford against Liverpool. Liverpool produced 3.6 XG. Manchester United produced 0.7. Okay? Yeah. And what did Klopp famously say after that game? If they play like this against Arsenal, they'll get beaten badly. Yeah. Liverpool had 27 shots to United's nine. Okay. They had 62% of the ball, but United got the two goals they needed to get out of there with a the result. Yeah. One came from Bruno Fernandes, who I think is the one really elite player in that team. And. The other came from Kabi Mainu, uh, interestingly enough, in the 67th minute. Um, I think if you want to talk me into a story <laughs> of United having a chance in this game, I, I will let me give them the credit for the things they can do. They are a good counterattacking team. If they are able to put Hoyland, Garnacho, and Rashford up front and let Bruno Fernandes drop deep and distribute, yeah, they're going to hurt you. They're going to hurt you. They just are. Rashford might walk going backwards, but he runs going forwards. Bruno's the same way. I think there's no question in my mind 
that Manchester United are going to create a couple of big chances in this game and maybe score a goal. Maybe score two goals. I, I really think on the counterattack, they have the talent to be deadly, and I think Bruno Fernandes is one of the great players in all of football. I mean that. I think he plays for himself, and I don't like him, but he's brilliant. But there is no world where they're going to be able to take a team, turn a team. Clive, this is a true stat. All right, this is. I want to contextualize this for you because I think it is so important to understand how legendarily poor they have been. Only, only Sheffield United have conceded more shots this season than Manchester United. Let me see if they've actually surpassed Sheffield United yet. No, and and actually, so yes, they only. Sheffield United have conceded more shots than Manchester yeah. United. And on expected goals, uh, expected goal difference, right? So expected goals minus expected goals against. They are on, they are, what, 2019, 18, 17, 16, 15th in the league in expected goal difference. 15th with a minus 10. So it's not that I don't think they carry a threat because they they clearly do. Garnacho, Rashford, Hoyland, and Bruno dropping in, they carry a threat. It's that their level of disorganization at the back, a barely fit just returning Lissandro Martinez, Casemiro shielding in front of Johnny Evans, who showed, I mean, Johnny Evans showed against Mateta. He, he's done. He's done. Yeah. The way he approached that moment against Mateta, if you get him isolated on Kai Havertz, he's done, right? Lissandro Martinez, we could just, Throw the ball to Havertz if he's posting up on, on Lissandro. He's done. The yeah. other thing is they have no one to track Odegaard. The thing that stood out to me about Palace is it probably could have been six, seven, or eight because they blew a lot of chances where they were in space against United defenders. Yeah. I mean, if Declan Rice has that kind of space, if Odegaard has that kind of space, they're absolutely dead. They can't win the physical battle in midfield because no one can battle with Declan Rice that's going to be in the midfield. I mean, McTominay could if, if they're smart. I think they should play McTominay in midfield to try to just put a body on rice. But if Casemiro plays, you're playing down a man. And then you have Rashford between Casemiro, Rashford and Bruno, you have the Olympic walk speed walking team. So you just turn them around. So I, I, I do respect the threat they're going to carry. I really, I genuinely do. And I think that they will create chances. My optimism comes from the fact that a team that has conceded the second most shots in the league and is 16th or 15th on expected goal difference isn't suddenly, Clive, because they care, going to be able to turn up and be resolute. So now, granted, we've seen an Arsenal team not have its shooting boots on and, and drop points they shouldn't have. West Ham at home comes to mind, right? Fulham at home comes to mind. So football's weird like that. We, could we get varianced? We sure could. It happened to PSG just, just this week. So the, the warnings are all there that we could get variants. But I just think this team, which just won 5-0 over Chelsea and was 3-0 up at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, right, that wiped the floor with Bournemouth, that you know has come up against Bayern and Villa and understands what it takes to play good teams with intensity, has too much physically, technically, and structurally for a United team that has been an absolute sieve defensively. So that I mean, I, yeah. I'm not, look, I know everybody, if it doesn't go our way, they're going to come back and they're going to blame what I've said on this podcast to be the reason, which fine, fair enough. I've gone big. So I've, I've opened myself up to that. I'm not trying to do the fan YouTube channel thing. I literally believe that every data point on this Manchester United team, first of all, they're eighth. They're eighth. They're behind Chelsea. They're 16th on goal difference expected. And they're 19th on shots allowed. Clyde, there isn't, there isn't a world where suddenly they become Alex Ferguson's Manchester United. I just, no, there is the key, just don't play the badge. Don't play Old Trafford. Play the players because they're not very good. My, my nerves are not nerves based on any sort of uh, reality. They're just nerves based on historical soft factors. That's all. <laughs> you know. So um, they can't build up from the back. So the goalkeeper kicks it long. Well, you know what? We're quite good at the back in the air and we're quite good on second ball. So that's the end of that strategy gone. So the pressing mm. will have to be that aggressive. So we're going to have the ability to build up. We're going to have the ability to take shots. So everything you've said, I understand it, mate, because you guys have taught me how to look at the data. I understand it. Um, but looking at their patterns of play, they don't have patterns of play. They have moments of play. You know, and it's what we do in those moments. But again, with the team that we expect to be out there, we are we are ready for them. We're physically better, we're technically better, and we have a an idea of what we're doing. You can close your eyes and see that passing movement from us. 
without even thinking too hard. If you close your eyes and I ask you now to just tell me how Man United are going to play, you've probably got one or two passes in your mind from broken play from Bruno to one speedy forward. <clears throat> and that's it. You haven't got anything else in your mind that really works. you just got a goalkeeper sitting there with wrists that are made out of chocolate that break every time a shot comes near him. You, uh, they've, they've got problems in that defence. They really, really have. So if we go there with the right level of focus, and like I said earlier, if we go there, let's make sure we go there with the right mentality. That mentality could be decided on Saturday. And it's going to make Sunday really, really interesting. So that, the Kills yeah, got that, a big that's, job. That's, that is for sure. I do think whether we beat United, to me, comes down to the six inches between our ears. Because if yeah, it comes down absolutely. to the talent and the technique and the quality and the, and the structure and the coaching, it's over. It's over. Yeah. So it's the six inches between our ears and the bounce of the ball, right? Sometimes the bounce of the ball is, yeah. is what decides it. Um, you know, I certainly hope we're not talking about referees at the end of this. Um, you know, that would be a shame. But like, unless he's given us six penalties, in which case I'll talk about it, no problem. But I think... Um, you know, I hear a lot of people saying things like, oh, well, we've gotten to Manchester United against bad teams before and failed to win. But like, we've never been this good since the Invincibles. Mm. And they've never, and I mean this genuinely, that I have, this is the worst Manchester United team I have ever seen. I'm, I'm not saying that to be hyperbolic. Go through the numbers, watch them. They just lost 4-0 against Crystal Palace in front of the world on a Monday night and put up, not even half a fight. They didn't even put up a fight. Now, that may be the difference, that they're unmotivated and against Arsenal, they will be. I mean, I did see them draw Liverpool. I did see them beat Liverpool in the FA Cup. Maybe this is a team that when they care, they don't back the manager, but they back themselves. And when they care, they can do something. But even in those games, the data tells you they were smoked. 27 yeah. shots conceded against Liverpool. We watched that game, Clive. They should have been blown away. But yeah. football's weird like that. So outside of variance or us, let's say it, choking, you know, like not having the mentality for it, the the quality of the players on the pitch, and and the way they're set up and the structures of these teams, I mean this this would be like, you know what it is? It's like the reverse. It would be like peak Alec Ferguson coming up against peak Alex Ferguson's United coming up against Emery's Arsenal. It would be like that, you know. I think, it, it's, it's just that in reverse. I think um, this was the other way around. And also we were weak and we were rocking and we had some issues with our management and we had some issues with certain players and some players looking for the exit, et cetera, et cetera. They would absolutely bury us. They would yes. bury us. Yep. And Liverpool all, did, right? Yeah, Liverpool sure did they for a couple of years there. Absolutely. They would stick five on us. They would absolutely bury us and laugh. Chelsea have done it to us in the past when we weren't quite together and they stuck five and sixes past us. Yep, and that was part of the joy this time when we beat them five. There was there was a lot of joy in that ground for people that have suffered those those occasions. So, um, so even though I have my my nerves going to Manchester United away, and I get my head on, and I think, now, nah, mate, it's time to be ruthless. It's time to look beyond all of the what ifs, what ifs, what if they do that, and just say, no, we are this good. Let's go and show everybody we are this good. Let's go and show everybody that whatever Manchester City do, they're not damaging us for next year. I felt Liverpool have been damaged by City's relentlessness. At this moment in time, I don't feel we are damaged because we feel like we've done our best. You know, we're looking to improve, we're working progress, we're still young. So we're not damaged psychologically, but I don't let's make sure we're not damaged. Let's make sure we deal with Man United. So we can start to look forward into my favourite time of the year, which is a transfer window, <laughs> we can start to look forward and start to speculate how we're going to improve this thing because from the outside, we look like a very nice place to be, unlike the team we're playing yeah. at the weekend. Manchester United won nine, drawn three, lost five at home. They have 26 goals for at home, which puts them, uh, pardon me, 28 goals for, which puts them lower mid-table. They have 26, uh, 25 goals against at home, which puts mm. them again lower mid table, a plus three goal difference at home. Arsenal are the best away team this season by a decent distance, top on points by one, top on expected goal difference. 
uh, top on goal difference, plus 29 on our travels um, versus plus 31 at home. So, you know, certainly I, I don't think our away form is anything to be fearful of. Clive, it's, um, it is a tough game to analyze because on anything you can look at that matters in football that's tangible, this should be an Arsenal victory. Everything that's tangible in football, this should be an Arsenal victory. But it should have been a Liverpool victory when they went there. I think that's a warning sign. And, you know, a warning sign that Mikel can point to, by the way. You need that, right? You need you need to be able to say, hey, when they came to our place, but for the hairs on, you know, Gabriel's chest, <laughs> we could have lost that game. We yeah. had the warning sign earlier this season. That 3-1 victory, which was a lot of fun, could very easily have been a loss. Um, so we need to be vigilant, certainly, and we need to be sharp. But I think we are sharp, and I just look at our, you know, our, our recent run of results. We play better teams in tougher spots, and come away with something. So we'll have you know to see. I, the mentality will be a, b- a big part of it. Um, you know, what, I, and I would so, expect. Yep. Oh, sorry, mate. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. I think I've really the last three games: you know, Chelsea, Spurs, and, and Bournemouth. Bournemouth, we were well. Chelsea, I thought we were okay. Very sharp. Five nil. Sharp in the second half. Okay in the first half, a little bit sloppy on occasions, but we turned it up and, and dealt with them. Done. Against Spurs, I think we were very close to a statement win. Really close to a statement win. And they got away with it, really. And they got they got the maximum. They, they played quite well in the first half, actually messed up their moment. But they got the maximum reward for what they did in the second half. And mm-hmm. that made us all a bit edgy. So we we walk away at the points, but you know what? We left, we left two or three goals on the table. That could have been five as well if we'd done our job, been really focused. And gave them two. I mean, it was an error yeah. and a penalty. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And so they got the two goals. Similar to the Chelsea away game, they got two goals out of nothing and they walk away nothing. with a 2-2 draw. Right? So so we were close to a statement win. So I almost, I feel like we could do with a statement win. Bournemouth, we were sharp in the first half. Super sharp. We ended up with a penalty. And then we go and win the game free. They first talk about the referees' events. And so... I I would like to see a win where there's nothing else to talk about but how good we are. Do you know what I mean by that? Just, mm. this, this is how good we are. We are a coming force. We're going nowhere, right? Uh, uh, everybody's signed up. Even Jorginho signed up. And the ones that are not signed up are the ones we don't want to sign up, right? So everyone signed up that we really, really care about. And so it's this is not going away. But I don't want any doubts. So it's very... May United is so important for me to as a as a bookend to the season, regardless of what happens. Because Everton will take care of itself. Sunny day, last game of the season, new kits out. They're not getting out of dodge with anything. We know that. But it's all about May United for me. And if that's how I would team talk it. Make sure whatever happens, they get nothing. They get nothing from us. Would you do anything special, just as a quick tactical thing here? to shut down Bruno. I mean, he's he is the one player that legit scares me. I think he's created the most chances in the league this season. Um would you man mark him? Would you put rice on him to shut him out? Like cuz cuz here's the thing. We press. We know we press and we're really really good at it. He has shown in games against us by the way. He's hurt us in these games that he can drop deep and distribute first time to runners in behind with tremendous accuracy and quality. So would you do anything special for him? Because I think if 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 you wind up with a game where nobody notices Bruno, you're going to wind up with a game where United got smoked. Yeah, I, I think and the way that we play, we know that 11 is going to play. And probably the weakest defender in that 11 is probably Trossard. Would that be a fair comment from a defensive point yep. of view? Yeah. Because we, we just defend as a group. And the problem is we are so aggressive in our defensive movements, regains and pressing that I don't think he's going to be able to survive in that in that arena. Obviously, if the ball drops and there's a moment, fine. But we can run back. You know, when we when we lost to them, when we shouldn't have lost to them in our black kit last season, we didn't have the midfield dominance that we've got now. You know, Thomas Pye didn't play. Sambi played in that game, remember? And we got... We didn't quite have them, but even in that game, we really should have we should have beat them. We just didn't take our chances. We didn't take our moments, and they took all of theirs. 
we are so much better structurally now compared to that performance. And we've got so many more options of how to progress the ball, whether it be short, long, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> whether through midfield, whether we go long and then we drop second ball, or we go to the flanks and progress on the right side. We've got so many different ways of playing now that I think we've got more solutions for them. And I, I, I do feel even this season, we've had some really exciting moments, exciting performances. But I want a statement win. You know, that's mm. what I'm after. I want a statement win. And maybe this is the one. And it's funny, right? Because we have this thing we do where we say like, you know, but what if we don't take our chances? Look at the Bournemouth game. We, we opened them up, but we didn't score. It's so weird how your brain can play tricks on you in a way. Because I think of us that way too. Like the one thing that could hurt us is if we don't have our shooting boots on, Clive. We have outperformed XG by more than anybody in the league this season. Hmm. Just as we outperformed XG by more than anybody in the league last season. I mean, by a ton. Here's how much we've outperformed it. We are on the same expected goals, roughly, within one expected goal as Chelsea. But we're about 18 goals better than them. Yeah. Okay? We're actually an excellent finishing team. And the thing that just resonates here for me is like, if you told me we have under 20 shots on Sunday, I'd be stunned. Hmm. Stunned. So it is a tough one. I mean, you could argue that one of the toughest things to do is analyze games where all the data, all the track record, all the results point to one outcome because football very rarely delivers for you what you expect it to. But then again, we beat Chelsea 5-0. We were three 0 up on Spurs, so maybe this is just a case of we are too good. I, I think um, the the other thing that gives me a little bit of um, hope here, not that I think we need hope, but but I think Bowie's boys, my uh, optimism is even in a situation where let's say we make a silly mistake or they get in behind, they get a goal. This isn't a United team that has the ability to just shut the back door. You know what I mean? Like what would scare me is if I was like, they're going to low block us, they're going to stay compact, and they're going to counter. But they've the not shown an ability to really do that. I mean, this is a team that drew 1-1 at home to Burnley in a game where Burnley had a lot of opportunities to beat them. Burnley, right? Um, Sheffield United had what, two against them? Was that at Old Trafford? It was. Yeah. Wasn't that 4-2 in the end? So... You know what I'm saying? Like, I think the games that scare me a little bit are the ones where you're like, well, if we fall behind, they can get in their low block and protect the lead. Like that can happen, right? You can get, you can get stifled, stymied, but I I don't see a United team that's shown the wherewithal to do that. Like the, the, the only way they get points, I feel, is a game like Liverpool, right? Where they, they ride the variance luck. They get battered a bit. And at the end of the game, you're going, how did they do that? How did they pull that off? I know I keep, look, Guys, I want to be clear. People, I would love to give you the bear case, the reason why United are not the sitting ducks. And the case is that I think they can counterattack. But every single other thing I see from them has just been really, really poor. So if you want to be nervous because it's Old Trafford and because it's United, I get that. There's certainly no evidence in the way they played or the players they put out there or the manager they have or the tactics they employ or even their their form at Old Trafford. There's really nothing that says they have something for us. So I, there are going to be people who listen to this who hate it because like you're not being humble, you're not you're not being quite. But like, you want me to analyze United as they are, or do you want me to sit here and go, well, it's still United at Old Trafford? Like, I mean, I can do that, but I just don't think that's cromulent analysis, you know? Yeah, well, there's a little bit of me thinking is going. They're still United at Old Trafford, but then I have watched I know, all I get of it, those, it, I've watched all of those games and. And yeah, it's just um, it's just a matter of us doing our jobs, really. Elliot. I think um, it's 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 interesting actually because you look at all the inflation and we scored the most goals, conceded the least goals, but we scored goals in bunches, and we could do that to them on on the weekend. And when you're looking forward about what we need, we probably need someone who can score the goal at, against West Ham. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's what we're looking for. Or when we went one nil down against Villa, we we could control ourselves, not get too excited, and then equalize that game. You know, um, some of the times we have gone behind, we've not been able to find enough offensive power under pressure. That's been a, an issue this year, and also offensive power when fatigued. You know, I think we became sloppy in our finishing around Christmas, 
but I put that down to fatigue. When we got our fatigue out of our legs in Dubai, we come back with the same group of players and just just hit the rooftops, right? So mm. that's a developmental point for our scoring under fatigue. So what do we need to do? Make sure we're more efficient around these areas in our critical games. Make sure we're more efficient with our energy. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a really instructive season. Really instructive. And what I didn't suspect really was the impact of the Champions League alongside the league title push and what it does to us, what it does to our minds, what it does to us schedule-wise, what it does to the group, particularly in a competition that we have to relearn. I think that's been a learning that I didn't really, we weren't talking about last August when we were doing our previews. That's been a big takeaway. So how we manage that going forward is going to be the key because I'm afraid Arsenal people are expecting one of these two big trophies in the next three years. You know, they yeah. expect it to at least be competing for it at the very, very minimum. So we got to learn. I, I would certainly say that failing to beat this United <clears throat> to prevent us from sending the title race to the final day would, would hurt a lot. Um, and I, I don't want that hurt <laughs> in my life. Um, not this season, not as great as it's gone. You know, at a minimum, and look, I realize sending it to the final day could just be delaying the hurt, but there's something about being able to say we went right down to the final day. You know, I, I think that that's something we, you know, I, I get it. It's not a trophy, but I'd love to be able to say it. Speaking of trophies that don't really matter, I guess we can wrap on this. Um, the player of the season nominees and the young player of the season nominees have been announced. The young player of the season thing is a joke. Like they just need to revamp it. They need to revamp it. Because it's basically all the player of the season candidates. I mean, Saliba's on the list, Saka's on the list, Cole Palmer's on the list. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it should be sort of a, to use an Americanism, like a rookie of the year award, right? Like a player who's in their first season of playing two thousand minutes or more in the Premier League. It's some some kind of limiter that yeah. prevents it from just being the star players who have been playing thirty eight games a season for three seasons. Um, it, it, it's a dumb award, but. I'm sure there'll be Arsenal fans, myself included, who feel that Saka should have been on the big one, the the Premier League Player of the Season award. A couple things interesting there. Foden and Holland are the nominees from City. No Rodri, who I think we think is, if not their best player, their most important player. Most valuable player, player, to quote American yeah, words. Yeah. Most, <laughs> yeah, MVP. Yep, he's yeah. that. Um, Arsenal get Rice and Odegaard, but no Saka. And it's a tough one because if you said to me we can only have two on this short list, I'd pick Saka plus one. Saka would be my first choice. Odegaard probably my second and Rice third. Um, but you made this point, Clive. I don't know when these nominations were finalized, when the survey went around. Yeah. Saka has had a much, much stronger second half of the season than first half. Um, to be fair, Odegaard has as well. So that's worth pointing out, although Rice was a, a home run guy from the start. So maybe if these nominations were made yesterday, it would be Saka and Odegaard. Not that Rice doesn't deserve it. I don't know. I mean, it's hard because I have no issue with Rice and Odegaard being those guys. I do have an issue with it, with Saka not being there. Maybe they didn't want to pick three Arsenal players. I don't know. Cole Palmer's on there. I, I can't really argue. Oli Watkins on there. So like, I and uh, Isaac is on there as well. I guess it, it this is one of those things you can choose to get outraged about, but doesn't matter. Um, hell, maybe it lights a fire under Sack and he has a hat trick in front of the nation on Sunday. I would take that. But any any strong thoughts on it? Because I, given given the season we're having, I struggle to get too animated about it. But for me, any player of the season discussion related to Arsenal has to start with Saka and everything else follows from that. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, every game I go and watch, the first big shot, the first, the first cross, the first moment that gets excited, breaks the game open, nine times out of ten, Saka's involved in it. And, you know, I can't put a price on that, mate. He's our, he's our most threatening player. Another another attribute we have to add is more threat to our team. And he carries the threat, and Bayern Munich told us that, didn't they, how they how they played against us. So, ask Bayern Munich who they're making plans for when they're playing us in the Champions League quarterfinal. And it's that guy. And so mm. it's a shame that uh, his perception is not um, more broadly alongside my own and many other Arsenal people, but it's something he has to work through and something that um, only winning and continuing improvement will change that. You know, So I think he's well-respected in many, many spaces, but not enough for me. And they're not looking properly. Other nominees, Ollie Watkins had a great season. Um, 
Isaac's had a very great season, particularly later lately. Van Dijk, when Liverpool had all those injuries at the back in the Carling Cup final or Carabao Cup final, sorry, he was a one man defence. And if the if the Leafs went out then, I would have picked him too. I mean, he was amazing for that period when he was holding them together. And so it's almost not worth getting upset about it because guess what? People have different opinions on different players and we're going to do that for the next <laughs> few years of our lives as long as we're watching this game, you know? So um, I think I think Arsenal are going to be more represented in these awards going forward given the ages of our team and given how they're improving. And that's the most important thing. We have a number of players in these awards now, which is great. And there are others that couldn't be too far away. So we've just got to keep working at it and go from there. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I think I would certainly rather be in this situation where we're like, well, how can you leave Sack off? How can you leave Saliba off? How can you leave Gabriel off, right? Rather than clearly our player is this one guy and nobody else belongs on the podium. Um, we have a lot of players who belong on the podium. Um, and it's hard, right? Because I, again, the best way I can articulate this is if you're only going to pick two Arsenal players, you're going to wind up with players who almost certainly should have been nominated. But mm. for me, again, Saka is where it starts and the conversation flows from there. Um, and I, maybe this is me using my my American brain for like MVP. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I think that Saka, Saka's value, not just in terms of always being available and things like that is... The way we give him the ball for comfort, the way teams, to your point, have to strategize around him, the way he does the first critical action of a lot of our big games, right, to set us on our way. Um, I, I think he's so valuable in that way. And I confess, I, it, we do sometimes struggle, I think, with midfielders to evaluate how valuable they are. Not attacking midfielders, but like holding midfielders. Rodri is a great example. There is no world where Rodri should not be on that list. I mean, if you wanted exactly. to call him the Premier League player of the season, I would have no problems with it. Um, for Foden, to, I mean, Holland has to be on there because he has 25 goals. For Foden to be on there ahead of Rodri doesn't make any sense to me. But, you know, he is English. But Foden um, is the Football Writers Player of the Year. So this is yeah, this is what we're dealing with, sense. right? So Rodri, yeah. I think, what was it? I, I go, he missed four games and they've lost all four? <laughs> so you tell yeah. me, you tell me who... You know, you tell me. It's Who's just most like, valuable? Yeah. yeah, it's just it's just obvious to me. For me, for the teams that are fighting for the for the title right now, and you yeah. want to put, and let's be honest, right? Liverpool most valuable player for me is Van Dyke, right? He is the main man, right? Um, mm. I know your goals, man, Elliot, but no, nah, if you can't keep out your net, you're Man United, right? So, um, so Van Dyke's most valuable player for me, and for Arsenal, it's Saka. You know, and um, mm. and for City is Rodri, and that's and so those three should be on it. And the, we are the three that are by far and away the best three teams in the league. So as far as I'm concerned, we should dominate these awards. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and look, I mean, fundamentally, you could say the most valuable is Saliba because last season we saw what happens when he's out. We mm. become a mid-table team, <laughs> basically, yeah. is what we were for that run-in. Um, so it's hard to say. And th this is why these conversations are so subjective and I try not to get too drawn into them emotionally. I think they can be fun intellectual exercises, but to invest too much emotion in it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think there, there is no world where Saka doesn't belong on this, but it, it, you know, I don't know the criteria. I don't know when it was picked. So I, I just can't invest too much into it. I will be curious to see who gets voted Arsenal's player of the season by the fans. That will be interesting. I, my suspicion is that it comes down to Saka and Odegaard, and I'd and probably Rice. be okay. And and Rice. Yeah. I think one, two, three for me is probably mm -hmm. Saka, Odegaard, Rice in that order. Um, although I wouldn't get too worked up about it either way. I think, look, I think that's enough of that. We can leave it there tomorrow to lighten the mood, take your mind off of the intensity of playing this legendary juggernaut Manchester United at fearful, fearsome Old Trafford. Um, we're going to do best non-Arsenal moments of the season. Spurs with nine men on the halfway line. It's it's in there. I promise you it's in there. Spurs winning the title in October will be in there as well. Uh, that, that was a really fun moment for Spurs when they won the title in October. So <clears throat> there will be a lot of good moments in that one. I hope you'll join us. 
We will, of course, have a live instant reaction after the game at Fearsome Old Trafford against this juggernaut United team. And then uh, <clears throat> it's off to London. So very exciting week ahead. Clive's on Twitter, Clive PFC. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next week. My name is Elliot Smith, the Clock Twitter, Inc. Gunner. We love you. Could it happen? Could it? Is it on the cards? <laughs> we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, United nil. <laughs>